Welcome to this episode of Charging the Agency Frontier. Today, I'm grateful to interview a friend of mine, Amber Anderson, who owns Toten Pairs as a member of our Vetted and Vouch for Agency Collective. And I invited her today to give us a little bit more information on her sweet spot, what she does. And uh, I want to start with uh, a little bit of background, um, Amber, on kind of who you are, where you came from, and uh, Toten Pairs, what you do there. Sure. Thanks for having me, Robbie. I'm happy to be here. Um, so my name is Amber Anderson. I am the co-founder and head of strategy at Toten Pairs which is a branding agency that focuses, we're female focused with an expertise in intersectionality. Um, and my background actually is in tech. I started um, as an analyst and moved all the way into becoming a global engagement and product manager when I was in corporate seven years ago, eight years ago, I'm starting to date myself here. Um, and so it brings a really unique perspective to the table when it comes to being an agency owner, where we understand not just the concepts of you know, wanting to have a solid brand and marketing strategy, but also what it takes to actually build products and services that sell. So we're end to end, meaning that we generally partner with founders or executives uh, to understand what are the things that are going on in the market, who is our target audience, building products from their perspective, and then actually branding and marketing them, um, and then making sure that they're successful once they're there. Uh, it's an awesome intro. And I'm kind of curious just because I've known you for some time um, and seen a lot of kind of opportunities or we've talked about opportunities. Uh, do people, do brands, do your clients, do they, they oftentimes know uh, what they need or know that they need a more integrated brand experience or do you have to kind of educate them on what that means and what that entails? How often are they kind of looking for exactly what you offer versus you have to kind of say, no, this is how it should be done? Yeah, very rarely ever do people understand what it means to, to step forward and think about things from an integrated perspective. Uh, and I don't think that's a lack of care. I think it's a lack of awareness. Um, and so we've tried to do a good job from a Toten Paris perspective to first put a lot of education out there. It's the way that we think about things. It's the way we think about people, um, specifically women. So we went with women because women make over 85% of consumer purchasing decisions. And nine times out of 10, when I say we're female focused, people turn around and say, oh, that must mean that you're doing like nail polishes or if you're working with a female founder or if you're doing a female product. And I have to go back and say, that's absolutely 100% not what I'm saying. <laughs> what I'm saying is uh, women are influencing 85% of all purchases coming into their household. So that could be deodorant. It could be a tie for her husband. It could be the earbuds that are in your ear because she bought them for Christmas present, it means every product that's coming into the market, you need to take a look at it and see what's a woman's role in it. And maybe instead of saying, oh, it doesn't include a woman, so I'm going to leave it out, you should say, you know, let's make sure that she, where is she in this process? And once I understand that, then I start to build things around it, including my branding and my marketing campaign, because she's so heavily intertwined within the journey uh, from a customer and a buyer perspective. Gotcha. So that kind of explains a little bit the integrated brand experience. Uh, components and uh, what what they are, what why do they matter? I mean, I think you kind of explained it there. Because I really, I mean, I've been in the industry a long time, but uh, you know, to me, integrated brand experiences, I'm thinking more integrated capabilities more than I am, you know, the audience. And uh, and when you say 85%, I mean, that's a that's a huge percentage of most companies' target audience that's uh, you know making the decision that needs to be reached. So that's uh, certainly certainly is logical. Why why are there not more uh, kind of female focused uh, agencies out there. So, you know, there actually are quite a bit of women agencies out there. There's some that have been around for a long time. Um, and so there was, I think in 2012, 2013, a lot of studies that went around to even get to this number of like, what is women's purchasing power? Uh, and so from our perspective, there's been some awareness. People may not have been paying attention to it. And so we think it's important to raise that uh, so that you do pay attention. But there's this other aspect of not just having a female focused agency, but being intersectional in your thinking. So that women are not the same, right? Like when you talk about women, you need to think about they have different life journeys. There's a difference between a mother and an empty nester. There's a difference between a black mother who lives in Georgia versus a white mother who lives in San Francisco. Their experiences, their perspectives are all very different. So there's lots of uh, nuances to understanding women. And so finding an agency that focuses on women is one thing. Where we stand apart is that we understand women and we understand these intersecting and sometimes complex identities so that you can get really tailor-made with when you're building and marketing things to her. Love it. That helps. Definitely helps. Um, and which markets do women influence the majority of purchasing decisions? Is that something that is kind of a market-by-market -market basis or...? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the better question is which markets are women not? Because like we said, they're doing it so much. But if we were to talk about some really common ones, it's going to be food and beverage. Sometimes it's over 90% of the decisions are made. Healthcare is another one when it comes to making decisions, doing the research um, about which providers are we going to use, what products are we going to bring in. Uh, women are heavily influenced there. And even when it comes to purchasing products for men, I think the stats are up to like 50% of the time purchases for men are made by women. Gotcha. And then you mentioned uh, intersexuality, uh, intersectionality, and uh, you know essentially how it's important uh, when you're building products and services for women. Um, I'm kind of new to that term. What, what does that exactly? What does that mean? Yeah. So intersectionality is taking into account multiple identities. So, for example, race, uh, sexual orientation, culture, language, class, um, and identifying that we have these basic, you know, buckets like gender. And we could look at things in these big, large buckets, but the reality is you get much closer to understanding a person when you take in their intersecting identities, which we call layers at Totem Pairs. So once you start adding on these various layers, then you start to see that these women segment themselves out. And the more you can understand how different they are, the better it is for you as an organization to connect with them. So which layers, as far as race, sexual orientation, religion, language, culture, um, should marketers, creatives, tech teams consider when building in products and services, experiences uh, for women, which, which matter? So they all matter because uh, they all make up your audience. And so I think, again, the better thing is to focus on who is it that we're trying to go after? What value are we providing and who's the audience that can come into play with really receiving this? A good example is when it comes to like fertility treatments. I think African-American women suffer with fertility at double the rate as white women. And yet majority of the organizations that market or, or develop these services do not or very rarely ever target the African-American community. And so because they didn't take into consideration that layer, they weren't able to go after probably their largest segment, right? And so they completely missed it. And so instead of saying, okay, we're just going to look at women and now we'll think about them, it really is stepping back and doing the work, like researching what does it look like in these different communities? What are their challenges? What are the, the needs that they have? And how do we provide value to them? with an unbiased lens, right? And once you do that, then you can come back and say, okay, now here's who our real target audience is and start creating really solid integrated experiences for them. Gotcha. And then what is an intersectional journey map and why is it important to consider the stages of a woman's life uh, when creating products or services for them? Yeah, so the intersectional journey map is what I was just kind of referring to, where it's this concept of taking a look and saying, here's what the market looks like. Now let's talk about the different layers that make up this particular persona and then take her through her journey. So, you know, like I said, a new mother's experience is very different from a mother that has a toddler, from a mother that has a teen child to a mother that has a college student and now someone that's an empty nester how they look at the world, the way that they're, the challenges that they're facing, um, all of those things are incredibly different. And that's just a small example as across the spectrum, right? But you can clearly see that if I were to think about who this person is as she changes, my brand should change and shift as well with her. Uh, uh, and that's the best way to stay connected. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, so how do businesses and brands implement uh, data-driven strategies when marketing and developing products for women? Uh, you know, so I think first and foremost, it starts with the data and understanding your audience and doing the work. We a lot of times see people jump directly to things like, I need a website, or I need a social media person, or I just need a logo. And I think that's the wrong question to ask. The first thing you should be asking is, who is my customer and understanding them so deeply that you now can really see things from their perspective. Then you start to look for people who can build things or develop or design with her in mind. Uh, and so I think that's the the for, and like the biggest thing that, that really I would say is a recommendation is to stop for a minute, think about your audience, and then make sure you're building strategies and bringing on the team members that understand that audience. So no longer asking questions like I need to find a designer that's in the tech industry or that has familiarity with healthcare, but asking somebody that understands my demographic. And if you don't understand your demographic, then starting there. Gotcha. And then the other thing I wanted to touch on is, uh, you know, basically mommy marketing, uh, where the power and influence of, of that has just really grown. Uh, what are businesses that you've seen? What are they getting right? And then where are they missing the mark when it comes to resonating with mothers? Yeah. So I think moms are a great segment of the population because they really are 
you know, they know their stuff, right? So from the point in time in which a mother is pregnant or thinking about it, they're already doing their research. They're researching brands. They're trying to understand the products that are involved. I mean, getting into the nitty gritty of understanding the ingredients that are in the food, right? So you've got one of your top researchers on their hands. So they probably know more about you than you know about them. And so I think the first thing to understand is that in order for you to connect with moms, they need to trust you. And they don't build trust just by you throwing product at their face. They're going to have trust by being able to understand what your value proposition is. What is your product or service actually going to do for me? And how does it impact my family? Uh, and one value add that's come up is, you know, the mommy bloggers and being able to use influencer marketing to help you with that. And by understanding that you're connecting with somebody who understands this audience right? So not just throwing out articles to them, but really partnering with them to understand the demographic, leveraging their expertise to build customized, you know, campaigns or whatever it is that you'd like to leverage with them. And then allowing them to help you uh, connect with that, the women in that space. It's just an awesome opportunity. Now, when it comes to things that are not working, I'd say, again, assuming that all moms are the same, it's just, you know, flat out not true. There's so many different layers of motherhood and their journey that uh, when you talk about moms, I think you need to really spend some time to understand where they are and so you can connect with them authentically. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, and then women of color experience a different set of challenges uh, when engaging with products and services. Uh, lack of authentic representation in traditional media to uncheck biases just built into the products and services that they use. Uh, how does the intersection of gender, culture, and race you know, shape a woman's perspective? It's a complicated question, right? Um, I think the first and foremost element is that just understanding the differences and the layers and the perspectives. And I gave the example of fertility treatments and the fact that women of color are suffering, black women in particular, like this particular segment for some reason is struggling at double the rate than you know, the white population. And yet when you go to the websites or you look on their Instagram page, you don't see yourself represented at all really leads to a, um, you know, a separation from you and that brand, right? So I think being able to go into the, the details and understanding the journey these women are facing, the discrimination they may be facing by not being represented uh, and feeling isolated, you really have an opportunity to connect uh, with them in a much more authentic way than you could in, in other segments. Uh, and so it just opens up an era of opportunity because women of color have been excluded from the conversation and the tables for so long that brands that actually step up to the plate and do the work really are going to find you've got an audience and, uh, you know, an ambassador for life. Are there any brands in particular that, uh, that you look up to or, you know, hold high in terms of how they handle their, their marketing and, and kind of looking at uh, these layers and intersectionality and, and all these concepts and, and doing a, a robust job at reaching, you know, the audiences that they need to be reaching and talking to a diverse group of people? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think BuzzFeed has been doing some really cool stuff, both on their content side as well as on their product side. So being able to see that you're seeing things like little small things, like being able to have a brown hand involved in the recipes and being intentional about, about that, right? Or being able to bring content to the table um, that traditionally isn't seen from that audience's perspective uh, is something that I think that the brand has done intentionally, and you can see it starting to pay off. Uh, in the long run as they start to engage younger demographics that expect that. Do you think, uh, this is just kind of from my perspective, you know, seeing maybe small to mid-sized companies, uh, I could see them paying less attention or spending less money, uh, just, oh, we, we don't have the, the ability to get that deep in terms of our marketing and to, you know, to go into those layers and everything. Do you, do you see that uh, yourself? Is it the larger companies that, you know, really push these initiatives more and maybe the small to mid size that just don't really know how to jump in the pool and, and maybe feel like there's uh, just too much expense or things like that associated with it that kind of prevent them from doing things the, the right way, basically? Yeah, totally. I mean, the larger companies have the data, right? So they already know, they already knew 85% of the purchases were women. And that's why their branding and their marketing has already been designed around that. Um, and so that gives them the upper hand because they have the data to be able to justify what they're doing. Uh, the smaller and mid medium sized businesses, I think that again, if they shift their perspective, it's not necessarily ab always about spending a ton of extra money as much as it is just bringing in the right people right? Yeah. People who have the perspective, people who understand the demographic. And uh, I think that comes from shifting your ideas from saying, I just want to have a website 
to understanding that this is my target audience and I really get them. Let's bring in the people who understand that audience so that they can build the right website, right? They can build something with a perspective in mind that takes our audience uh, into consideration. Gotcha. So, so I think it's certainly a lack of understanding and education about this is a space that I'm missing out on, but it's also about shifting our mindset in the way that we go after work. How do you, uh, I'd be curious, uh, just because there's going to be quite a few agency owners uh, as well watching this, uh, watching the show, uh, you know, how would you kind of advise them to, uh, to think about some of the things that we've talked about uh, on today's show and, and maybe start to integrate some of this into their own agency, even if they're not positioned as a, an agency that, you know, markets to women or, you know, whatever it is, even if they want to kind of keep their positioning the same, but just be more aware and more cognizant of how they're uh, planning things out. What, what, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two things. One, you know, people say it all the time. I think you have to diversify your team. So when we say things like this is our company culture and this is just the way it is, then recognizing you might be leaving out some of those key perspectives that are going to help, you know, build a more inclusive product and service and offering. Uh, so diversifying your team is incredibly important and it just pays off, right? So I always look for my team should represent uh, the audience that I'm putting out. So if you were to look at our team, we're incredibly diverse and that's with intention. I don't have all the answers and I can't speak to everything, but my team and making sure my recruiting practices brings in that knowledge and experience uh, is part of what we do. And I would expect uh, and, re and recommend that everybody should be doing the same. I think the other piece is taking the time, right? We sometimes often jump into going right into the deliverables instead of doing the work to do the research and the strategy up front that's necessary to ensure that whatever we're building is aligned appropriately with our audience. So really doing that time, asking those additional questions, making sure you're taking into consideration intersectionality. I don't think it's complicated when we start to step back for a minute and see what we're talking about. It just really makes sense. Like the data is there, the people are there. You could do a focus group. You could reach out to us. You could, you know, do a Google search. I mean, there's so many different ways for you to be able to see different perspectives nowadays. Um, I think it just needs to be a priority on your end to make sure you're doing it. Gotcha. So awareness is, is really key. Maybe watching something like this and then, okay, well, that's something I need to implement into my own business and figure out, you know, where I need to start. Kind of like, uh, you know, I mean, anything in life, usually the first step is always just being aware of it so that you yeah. can actually take action and, and do what's needed to, make the next steps. Yeah, I'd say also, sense. you know, stepping out of your space, right? So if you were to look at yourself and say, what does my circle look like? It probably looks like you. So if you have an opportunity to step out of your space, you know, I wouldn't use your social media because a lot of the algorithms are tied to what they think you want to hear, but look at a blog post you would never look at before. Go to a site that doesn't have anything to do with you and see what people are talking about. Step out of your comfort zone. I was going to say that, but that's scary, Amber. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think it's not scary because it gives you an opportunity to kind of see what the real world's like, you know, see other yeah. people's perspectives. Even if you don't agree with them, you got to learn to respect the way that they see things because their life journey is so different than ours. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of us uh, just want to be in our, our comfort zone and want things to be comfortable and easy. And, you know, but at the other hand, we, we struggle because we, we want growth and we want, uh, we want other things that need to happen. So it's just pushing ourselves out of that comfort zone and exposing ourselves to, to things that, you know, maybe we're, we're not. And um, I think there's, I think there's a lot of people that live in silos that, you know, maybe yeah. are just kind of cutting themselves off from uh, experiences and things that, you know, would, would open the doors, but, um, but it's tough, you know, I mean, we're creature comforts. I mean, that's a, that's yeah. a phrase for a reason. Well, I think one thing that is helpful too is the data is just there about why you need to do it, right? So when it comes to us personally, that's one thing. When it comes to us as agency owners or as companies, it's not about me. It's about the fact that I, there's a whole community out there. If I'm trying to grow this business or I'm trying to help my client that I'm not tapping into. So instead of us going through all these crazy growth hacks to try and figure out how do I use LinkedIn differently, the answer might be right in front of our face. You know, it could be just tapping into a community we've not been talking to. And so those are the types of things that I think as, um, you know, agency owners and strategists and designers and marketers and CMOs, like sometimes the answer is so easy for us. It is stepping out of our comfort zone, but the results are just so big, you know? Yeah. Love it. I'd love to end on that note. Uh, so I want to thank you for your time today, Amber. And, uh, and also I want to ask, uh, how can those watching, listening, uh, contact you, learn more about Totem Pairs, get in touch? Uh, what's the best way? 
Yeah, so you can check out more about us on our websites, just toteandpairs.com, and it's and the word. I'm sure, you know, Robbie, you can point people to it. For me, you know, directly through our website's great, or you can just email me at amber at toteandpairs.com. Awesome. Very cool. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show, and uh, I'm sure we'll be uh, distributing this to a lot of areas, especially on social media, where people can ask questions and uh, be able to be involved on giving them the answers. But uh, a lot of it, like you said, is just the awareness and information and putting that out there. So just appreciate your time and doing that. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Amber.